Gatekeeping works. The fans have proved it. Rachel Ziegler's Snow White was delayed. Her new movie, Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, won a participation trophy only because the Marvels flop. Plus, Disney's new animated film, Wish, fizzled out like wet fireworks. Now the Mouse House recently warned shareholders they prefer pushing their social message over the customers paying to watch their movies. And they're paying the price for it. The same way that Amazon's Rings of Power was humiliated around the world in the ratings, for trashing Tolkien. The good news is, fans' love of story will always trump Hollywood's hate. What's going on, everybody? Hollywood has a new motto. Every loser can be a winner. Do you have a terrible audition experience? I do. I do have a terrible audition experience. What is it? Your poor baby. Hunger Games, the ballad of bad writing and Big Mouse limped to the number one spot two weeks in a row. Yet the film bombed financially. So is it a win? Sure, why not? Because in Tinseltown today, a movie doesn't have to be good to win. It just has to lose money slower than the competition. Or at a minimum, feed the ego of its lead actress so she doesn't attack the production. I just wanted people to miss her when she was off screen. That was like the thing that I wanted to capture the most um, because I would miss her when I was, when she wasn't on the page. I'm a narcissist. <laughs> Hunger Games didn't crush the Marvels or Disney's wish. The Mouse House did that all on its own. And that's really what we call a hollow victory, not something to brag home about. Someone better tell Rachel Zegler. I think Francis was trying to find every proper w possible way to make me scared and confront a fear. And I kind of realized I don't have any. And I kind of realized I don't have any. Weird. Weird. The bright note is for Zegler, she actually won something. Her movie is the lowest ranked film in the Hunger Games franchise. The most dangerous thing that a young actor or actress can do is to believe her own publicity. The Hunger Games prequel is another failed franchise relaunch in 2023. The movie didn't fail because it was whoa. Not really. It simply isn't any good. It's not horrible either. It's just the best of the worst that's out in the cinema today. As for Zegler, her public displays didn't help the film's chances to succeed. One minute she's trying to play this generation's Norma Ray, standing up for the little people while being the voice for the supposedly voiceless in Tinseltown. I say if I'm going to stand there 18 hours in a dress of an iconic Disney princess, I deserve to be paid for every hour that it is streamed online. The next minute, she's hopping over all of her fellow actors who are holding picket signs all to wear designer high heels to go to her red carpet premiere. This is the typical Hollywood tale. We all stand up for the little guy, as long as it means we don't miss the chance at our spotlight. The Hunger Games prequel starts 64 years before the original movie, showing a young Coriolanus Snow on his journey to become the future's villainous President Snow of Pan Am. You got Tom Blythe playing the role, and he's about as interesting as an instruction manual for a blender. He's a man on a mission to restore his family's name, to promote men wearing dresses for the Hollywood Hive, and to fall in love with Rachel Ziegler's Lucy Gray Baird before mentoring her as the seemingly perfect competitor for the 10th Hunger Games. Unfortunately for him, the actress's bad impression of a Dolly Parton accent makes Amy's fake Texas twang from the series Community sound almost like an authentic Southern belle. Thank you kindly. Deedly do. The 10 Hunger Games are missing all of that electric pomp and parade found in the 75th with Jennifer Lawrence's Katniss Everdeen that made it so special. Now see, think about it like a Roman gladiator arena. It's more butcher shop minus the charm and then everything fades to black. It's the things we love most that destroy us. The production shoehorned in Donald Sutherland's narration, and it comes off as a desperate attempt from the director to remind the audience, now get this, at the end of the film, that the movie that they just saw is in the same world as the original Hunger Games. Talk about treating your audience members like they have the same low IQ as a typical Hollywood producer. It's not the first in the film, nor the last. That would be its runtime. But it's so long it makes everything seem pointless. The Hunger Games, the ballad of boredom and numb butts runs for two hours and 38 minutes. You got a cast seemingly sleepwalking through an uninspiring plot searching for purpose. Peter Dinklage, he phoned in his performance as if he was still on the set of Game of Thrones playing the imp. It's bad directing, bad writing, and cast. 
Tom Blythe has presents to burn. Talent, not so much. Ziegler chews up through the dialogue like she's spitting tobacco while getting sick. Neither of their on-screen characters are worth rooting for. Snow and Lucy use one another. He needs her to win. She uses him to survive. So without a hero or a believable love story due to the co-stars lacking any chemistry, what are you left with? An ugly postmodern philosophy story that's about everybody using everybody in a game of what's in it for me. But I'll say this. The cinematography was spot on. And Viola Davis, she's a lot of fun to watch, giving her performance as a demented version of Willy Wonka. I've broken free of my laboratory today to examine you, the leaders of the next generation. If the hope was that Hunger Games, the ballad of long titles and losers, was supposed to become a major franchise player, they failed. Raking in over $200 million worldwide doesn't show like there's a lot of audience interest. And if box office projections are to be right, the prequel is about to lose its title as a winner among losers. In its third week, you have Beyonce's new film, Renaissance, is about to take away its top spot. And it couldn't have happened a nice production, especially after its own lead actress treated it like sloppy seconds. I didn't audition. It was just I got a call from my agent that was like, no. You, an actor? That's madness. And I just kind of put my name back into the mix and got it. The reality is Rachel only crawled back to the Hunger Games set after another film part fell through. To top it off, she had the director replace the actress that had taken her part. She removed her. So think about this. How is a studio supposed to sell a fantasy, a film about wish fulfillment and hope at overcoming the odds when one of its lead cast is crushing other people's dreams? They're not. It's one of the reasons it failed. Because every decision made in the movie in front or behind the camera is in every aspect of its DNA. Film is too intimate not to feel it. And Zegler, she's more poisonous than Marie Larson. Is that like a personal attack or something? Walt Disney once said, all our dreams can come true if we only have the courage to pursue them. Barely two weeks after the Marvels flopped, Disney's film Wish, which was meant to celebrate a hundred years of animation excellence, bombed at the box office, confirming the Tragic Kingdom's worst nightmare. And they have two movies that lost them a combined half a billion dollars. A shitload of money. Wish is just Disney's latest take on a corporate fairy tale. In the kingdom of Rosa, giving up your dreams is a state policy. You have King Magnifico rules his subjects like a typical sorcerer in sheep's clothing. He demands every citizen's biggest dream. He hoards them and gets power from that. And Arasha, a teenage rebel who wants to bring down the tyrant. This isn't just a fantasy story. It's a mirror to our world where politicians promise the moon while picking your pockets. And King Magnifico once a month grants one lucky citizen his wish. But if you are actually asked to have your dream come true, you'd have your memory erased. Where does that sound familiar? Think about it. What is the point of the story? It's saying do as you're told or get ready to experience a living hell. All of those who think that third parties ought to be making people's decisions for them. In other words, people who think that everything that's wrong with the, the country is due to the fact that other people are just not as smart as they are. And if only they could, you know, or people like them could take over and make our decisions, we'd be so much better off. The island kingdom of Rosa can give real world regimes a run for their money. I don't know if this is art imitating life or is it just another Hollywood daydream? I dream of a utopian metropolis where all mammals are equal. And we're close. Wish is a hot political mess. It's got a script that feels half written during a discussion on social justice and a cast that feels like they weren't allowed to reach for their true potential with songs that aren't very good. But the real evil sorcery here is the cheap animation. And what's the result? It feels like Disney wanted this film to purposely fail. It's so simple. Step one, we find the worst play in the world, a surefire flop. Step two, I raise a million bucks. Step six. We take our million bucks, we fly to Rio de Janeiro. This isn't a movie. This is the Mouse House's corporate manifesto. And it's the exact same reason why people have started turning their backs on Hollywood studios and costing them billions of dollars. Well, yeah, I think the issue is ultimately, what are you selling in the end? You're selling creativity. But the problem has always been with the studios, although the beginning of the studios, the entrepreneurs who ran the studios were sort of creative guys. Disney didn't listen when it came to the Marvels and it flopped. Now Wish is paying the price for the studio going woke. Part of what happened while you were gone from the company 
uh, was a number of films that were greenlit that people were describing as woke with, quote, woke characters. I'm so curious what you think has happened and how you as a company are supposed to deal with that and what you feel like you can say and can't say given this remarkably polarized climate we're in right now. Our primary uh, objective in creating content as a company, say for ABC right. News, which is obviously to inform, but is to entertain. But working with you showed me that that's bullshit. The one good thing is by law, Disney has to tell the truth in their Securities and Exchange Commission filings. Those are the reports they put out saying the financial strength or weaknesses of the company, what their future plans are, and what impact that will have on the stock prices. See, those reports are public, and they share and lay out all the risks for current and future shareholders. But what about everyday fans and everyday customers? They're just kept in the dark, all while good old Bobby Boy Tap Dance is trying to bring them back on board. Creators lost sight of what their number one objective needed to be, is to return to our roots, which is remember, we have to entertain first. It's not about messages. Not one thing he said to that reporter was true. It's the exact opposite of what's in Disney's own report. Further consumers' perceptions of our position on matters of public interest, including our efforts to achieve certain of our environmental and social goals, often differ widely and present risks to our reputation and brands. Blah, 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 legalese. Translation, we're a public for-profit company that no longer is in business to make money or entertain people. They're not here for you and me to make magic at the movies. They're here to push an environmental and social message. They know what that means. Disney now is not going to change. They just declared it. They're not going to change so they go bust or they get bought out. And that's coming, especially after Elon replied to their advertising boycott. I, I hope today. they stop. You hope? Uh, don't advertise. You don't want them to advertise? No. What do you mean? If somebody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go f*** yourself. But go f*** yourself. <laughs> is that clear? I hope it is. Great news is his battle cries resonated around the world and tens of thousands of people have canceled their Disney subscriptions. Gatekeeping works. Fans are making Hollywood studios pay for replacing the magic of true storytelling with safe space seminars and cinematic lectures. It's just a shame that Amazon Prime didn't pay a little bit more attention to the damage Disney was doing but turning its back on its own customers. Eight things the Rings of Power does better than Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies. I almost spilled my coffee reading that headline. I mean, I don't know what kind of writer will type that up, but it's ridiculous. See, Amazon is getting ready to gear up for season two of Rings of Power coming in 2024. This time, instead of attacking Professor Tolkien by branding him a bigot, they're taking a different tack. Their new marketing angle is to push the lie that Rings of Recycled Fantasy actually somehow improved on Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. Just uh, threw up in my mouth a little bit. Crazy, right? The only person who's happy with that is Prime's very own consultant, the traitor to the Tolkien legacy, his grandson, Simon. Um, I kind of liked the first first one. And my problem with the films was really that uh, I think Jackson was kind of too faithful to the book. He kind of put too much into it. So I'm not going to go through the entire list that Screen Rant put together, probably getting it from Amazon themselves, because it's just quite frankly unbelievable. But they go off and state how all of a sudden elves have now more variety. Sauron was improved in Rings of Recycled Fantasy. And as for Middle Earth, it's finally more diverse and reflective of the world in general. It is everything. It is everything for um, people of color. It is everything to progress forward as a woman of color and to be part of a redress of balance within this world. What the fuck are you talking about? It's ridiculous. Well, obviously Prime Season 2 is going to face a far worse fate than Season 1. Not only does it have an audience, but the studio didn't learn any of the lessons they needed to. They just ignored them. So I'm going to stick with the man who knows how to make great films, who loves Tolkien and honors the canon always. We had no interest in putting our messages in, into this movie, but we thought that we should honor Tolkien by putting his messages into it. Wow. Man, the next time you hear a Hollywood studio apologize saying, we're sorry, we know we screwed up, we'll never do it again. Please come back to us, baby. 
Just remember what happens. When baby goes back, baby gets slapped again. And if you enjoyed that video and found value in it, hit the subscribe button. Leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Tell me what you think about what's going on today and share with everyone you know. To win every battle and stay true to yourself, all you have to remember is we never bow down. We never bend the knee. Always forward. Yeah. <laughs>